Over the summer, a group of influencers were in hot, hot water because of a Xi'an influencer trip to China. For those who don't know, Xi'an flew out a handful of influencers to tour and showcase one of their Chinese factories that makes some of Xi'an's many clothes. Or at least, Xi'an claimed this was one of their factories. Scandal broke out because many argued the factory that was toured in the videos was a complete misrepresentation of Xi'an's actual working conditions and process, which is allegedly full of labor violations from long hours, poor health and safety, safety conditions, and even the forced labor of China's Uyghur Muslim population. It's even reached the point of a U.S. congressional investigation. So with allegations like these swirling around, how did we get here? How did we reach a timeline where Xi'an drops up to 10,000 new items every day, and has become the top fast fashion brand in the United States, making up 50% of all U.S. fast fashion sales, a larger percentage than competitors like H&M and Zara combined? Well, let's rewind to Xi'an's start 15 years ago and discuss how the business of Xi'an has affected our larger concept of fast fashion, ethical business, and our role as consumers. But before that, if you are new here, hi, I am Kara, and I make videos on the intersection of money, media, and intentional living. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, be sure to subscribe. And you might also like my video, The Terrifying World of Timu, which does a similar deep dive on the company Timu. Also, if you are someone like me who loves your privacy, then today's sponsor, Delete Me, is perfect for you. Delete.me is not only an incredible supporter of this channel, but they are an even better platform for protecting your information online. Delete.me is a hands-free subscription service that will remove your personal information that's being sold online. Information like your name, current and former addresses, email addresses, age, and phone numbers. With Delete.me, you'll receive a Delete.me privacy report every three months that breaks down where they found your information and what's being done to remove that information. I've been using Delete.me for months now and I think it is fantastic because when I I Google my name now, no longer do past addresses and phone numbers and all of that show up. It is all completely gone. And as a woman on the internet and as someone who is paranoid about things like identity theft, that is very comforting. In my most recent report, Delete Me reviewed over 5,500 listings. They removed 49 listings and they found 28 data brokers who had my information. I seriously cannot recommend Delete Me enough. So if you're interested in getting your own detailed report and having your information stay private, you can use my discount code code Kara for 20% off. That's code Kara, C-A-R-A, at joindeleteme.com slash Kara, which I will link down below. Thank you so much to Delete Me for sponsoring this video. Okay, so how did Shein come to be? Shein first came to life in 2008 as an e-commerce site selling wedding dresses that were made in China. But just like how Amazon got its start selling books and then transformed into the behemoth that it is today, Shein did the same. In 2015, the company's strategy moved beyond wedding dresses to sell an array of fast fashion. And in 2020, the year the pandemic spread across the globe and everyone was stuck shopping at home, was the year things really went crazy for Shein. I checked out the Google Trends data dashboard and you can see exactly where the term Shein exploded in popularity. I mean, just look at that jump. And it makes sense. So many of us were at home quarantining in 2020, in-person stores were shut down, and according to the US Census, in 2020, e-commerce sales increased by 43%, growing 200 and $44.2 billion. But hold on, fast fashion is not new. It's been around since the 90s and we've had plenty of big dogs before. Zara, Forever 21, H&M, which by the way, I for the longest time thought it was called ham because of the and sign looking like an A. Anyways, so Shein adopting this fast fashion model in which new trends are introduced quickly and affordably isn't a novel concept. If that's the case, why and how did Shein quickly outpace all of the other big dogs to the point where they're now valued at $100 billion? Because that, my friend, is a Clifford the Big Red Dog sized dog. Well, for all of the cons that people love to point out about Shein, myself included, I think it's first important to point out what they do exceptionally well. Because despite all the bad, there are some really impressive strengths that we should mention. Especially because I think we could potentially apply the things Shein does well to transform the fashion industry, and perhaps the business world as a whole, for the better. For one, social media. If you're online and seeing any type of fashion content, there is a good chance you've come across Shein at some point. I'd argue Shein's claim to fame is the viral Shein hauls that flood YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok on a daily basis, a phenomenon I actually covered in my recent video about haul culture. Shein are masters of the social media marketing craft. As e-commerce DB explains, their strategy relies heavily 
study on employing influencer marketing, focusing on nano and micro influencers by giving these influencers free Shein clothes to make videos about. This strategy is a symbiotic relationship, like how sharks and remora fishes both benefit from one another. In our case, Shein is the shark who gets cheap marketing from influencers that leads to mass audiences wanting to buy Shein clothes. Meanwhile, the remora fish, or influencers in this lovely animal analogy, not only get free clothes, but also sweet, sweet content. People love watching Shein unboxing and try on videos, and for a creator looking for the next video to keep the content hamster wheel going, having an endless supply of content like this is extremely valuable. This mutually beneficial relationship has made the Shein hauls such a staple of internet culture that it's a format in itself, something that people now voluntarily create without even getting freebies from Shein. And that internet buzz converts straight to sales for Shein, specifically across millennials and Gen Z. Those two generations are most likely to be aware of and using Shein, and they're the ones driving Shein's utter dominance over its competition. Now, some might be quick to argue that any type of influencer marketing is inherently bad, but I personally disagree. Caveat, I am technically an influencer myself and I'm sponsored by brands, so of course I am very biased here, but I personally think that influencer marketing is just a natural evolution of the art of marketing itself. In my opinion, it's a neutral term, one that's externalities are connected to the brands being promoted and the behaviors being encouraged. Like influencer marketing for something like diapers feels a lot more positive than something like vaping. In the case of Shein, I think the powerful tool of social media is being used to support a company with, let's be honest, highly questionable labor and sourcing ethics, while simultaneously encouraging habits that promote excessive waste that stuffs landfills across the globe. But I don't think it has to be this way. Yes, one day maybe we see Shein move away from from ultra-fast fashion and live up to the promises of sustainability that they and many other fast fashion brands have made. But what I think could be more impactful and realistic is if the excellent social media strategies of Shein were leveraged for the great companies out there pioneering what it means to be a more ethical business. From Patagonia and Allbirds on the fashion side, to even brands like Newman's Own Dressings where all the profit goes to charity. Now every brand is different, so I'm not saying that Shein's strategy needs to be copied a million times over especially if we want to avoid reinforcing the hyper-disposable lifestyle that she intends to encourage. But I think it is an interesting idea to think about how we might use the marketing strategies of a shareholder-focused company to scale more stakeholder-focused companies. Beyond social media, Shein's excellence really shines through with their supply chain model. Now, I'll be honest, for the longest time, I did not know what supply chain meant, but basically, these are the steps that it takes to get a product made and then into your hands. Creating, packaging, shipping, all of those are part of a supply chain, and Shein's is efficient as hell. Shein follows what's known as an on-demand model, meaning that they create inventory as the demand happens versus all up front. For example, say that we're selling a rainbow shirt. For some of those fast fashion brands, they might make 20,000 of those shirts and then hope that they get sold in stores. But Shein, on the other hand, will make a very small batch of 50 to 100 of those rainbow shirts. From there, their data-driven system will determine which clothes people want more of and then have those made to meet demand. This setup helps reduce costs for the company and also cuts down on inventory waste. In a Wall Street Journal profile on Shein, a Shein representative said the model, quote, saves around 30 to 40% in cost of goods sold on the garments alone. And this right here is really fascinating because it hits the sweet spot of being good for business because it's saving money while also being good for others. In this case, customers that get savings passed on to them and an environment that has fewer rainbow shirts sitting in holes. Now, there are risks to this on-demand model, namely supply chain vulnerabilities, meaning that if one link in the chain gets messed up, it can lead to shortages and price hikes. We have seen this a lot in the past few years. Supply chain issues due to events like the pandemic and the war in Ukraine were major contributors to inflation, which has in turn made people feel pretty down about the economy. This is why Shein's supply chain is again so brilliant, because they use what's called a vertically integrated supply chain, aka they own the different steps instead of always outsourcing. Okay, so lots of economics terms floating around, so I'm gonna pause here. Also, it is really hot. I just wanna say, in case I look sweaty, I'm not at my place right now, so I don't have my normal filming setup. I'm at my parents' house, and it is really hot, and I have to hold my microphone because I don't have a table, and my hand hurts. It's also 1.30 in the morning, so I think my voice sounds a little gravelly right now because of that. But okay, so you might be asking, what is Kara going on about right now? Does she like Shein? Does she not like Shein? What's the verdict? And to that, I would say, 
Number one, I think trying to categorize things into archetypes can make it harder for us to dig into that special sauce of nuance that moves us along as a society. And two, personally, I think that Sheehan's bad outweighs their good. Don't get me wrong, I am amazed by how well they've scaled and the innovations they've made with their on-demand model, and I'm excited by what other industries could learn from that model. However, Sheehan's negative impact cannot be ignored, like labor issues. The company was investigated in Channel 4's documentary Inside the Sheehan Machine, and using undercover cameras to film factory workers, the documentary exposed that many Sheehan workers were forced to pull 17-hour shifts to make hundreds of garments a day. And in one factory they covered, it was explained that the workers made a daily base salary of $20, but could be docked $14 if any clothes had mistakes. And like I mentioned in a past video, Shein clothes, like some other fast fashion brands, have been found to have high levels of dangerous chemicals in them, such as lead and phthalates. As mentioned in CBC's article on the topic, quote, scientists found that a jacket for toddlers purchased from Chinese retailer Shein contained almost 20 times the amount of lead that Health Canada says is safe for children. A red purse, also purchased from Shein, had more than five times the threshold. And of course, there's the environmental impact. We already know the fashion industry industry is a huge culprit for carbon emissions, but Shein specifically is on a whole new level. As Time reports, quote, the company leaves about 6.3 million tons of carbon dioxide a year in its trail, a number that falls well below the 45% target to reduce global carbon emissions by 2030, which the UN has said is necessary for fashion companies to implement to help limit global warming. What I worry about with all of this is that there are going to be tons of companies that attempt to emulate Shein's success by subsidizing their business with the labor, health, and environmental issues we just discussed. But that type of business practice is incredibly short-sighted in the grand scheme of things, which is why both policy mitigation and consumer responsibility is incredibly important. Now, I am no policymaker here, and I do not want to act like I have all the answers, but some of the options that I've seen mentioned include carbon taxes on businesses, enforced supply chain mapping for better visibility and accountability, and better enforcing U.S. import tariff laws for companies like Timu and Shein, who allegedly skirt these rules to cut prices. But the negative impact of Shein's rise isn't just its potential ripple effects on how we model successful businesses. It's also about how it touches us on an individual level, both financially and morally. The culture that Shein has cultivated with its ultra-fast fashion model has made our disposable lifestyle habits so much worse. According to a recent UBS survey of Shein shoppers, the average Shein customer is female, earns $65,300 in annual income and reported spending $100 a month on women's clothing. According to UBS, that's 60% higher than the average US woman. And okay, tough love here, and let me know in the comments if you disagree, if you think I'm missing something, please, I would welcome being challenged here, but I feel like this average Shein customer behavior is honestly a moral failing on our part. Now, I do not think that most or really anyone who is buying Shein is doing it from a bad place. I think a lot of times people just aren't aware of the environmental and labor issues associated. But if and when we know what we know, I don't see a world where buying $100 of Shein clothes a month is ever necessary. People love to argue that fast fashion is necessary for lower income folks. And again, please call me out in the comments if you disagree with my take here, but I don't buy that argument. Fast fashion like Shein might be necessary if you want to keep up with weekly micro trends on a budget, but following an ever-changing microtrend cycle is not a need. Thrift stores, both online and in person, offer incredible options. I've personally seen plenty of fantastic clothes under $15 on secondhand sites like ThredUp. Honestly, if you're someone who is buying $100 of Shein clothes a month, you can probably afford to buy more sustainably and ethically. Yes, you'll probably miss out on the latest Shein drops, but you will probably have a whole lot less clutter and a whole lot more money saved. I think our role as consumers is much more powerful than we think. And yes, there is a good argument for companies needing to be the ones to change first, but it's our wallets that pay the company's bottom line, and it's our demand signals that help shape their corporate strategies. When it comes to industries that aren't an absolute need for survival, so say fashion instead of pharmaceuticals, we have a lot more say in how they conduct business. We can choose to put our money toward companies that have ethical labor practices, that source sustainable and healthier materials, and that don't promote hyper-fast product turnover. I think more of us are waking up to 
the fact that we do have this power and to the idea that we have a responsibility as consumers to take control of our power. Xi'an has a lot we can learn from, both good and bad, but I hope that we can begin moving away from the models and habits that make a company like Xi'an so successful in the first place. But what do you think? What are your thoughts on Xi'an's business model and the way that it's changed our approach to clothing? And where do you think we go from here? Let me know your thoughts down below and what other topics you'd like to see me cover. And if you want to see a deep dive on the company Timu, go check that out here. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to my patrons on Patreon and those who support through Buy Me A Coffee. I appreciate you guys so much and I will see you next time. Bye.